What's up, everybody? Uh, this is Alex from Trombone Guide, uh, Guided Listening, Episode 4. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce you to John Romero, one of my good friends. John Romero is the principal trombone in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, arguably the most prestigious job in America. John is also um, a professor of trombone, uh, teaching at the Manus School, at Rutgers, and at Bard College. Uh, John previously held position as principal trombone of the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra. Uh, John is a graduate of uh, Baylor University and the Shepherd School of Music at Rice. Uh, and I'm so excited to have him here to talk a little bit about his process, his life, uh, and the way that he approaches the trombone. So welcome, John. Hey, Alex. Thanks for the, the intro. Um, and uh, thanks for having me on here. I also have to mention I am an S.E. Shires artist. Um, That's I right. Have to, I want to say that because it's a great instrument. <laughs> That's right, John. I think you're one of the first people that adopted the, uh, the new S.E. Shires twin valve, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's right. Um, still like it. Um, you know, like everything, it has its pros and cons, but uh, it's just really, really open in the, in the you know, it, it feels like I'm playing a straight horn for most of the horn, you know. Wow. Pretty great. Yeah, I, I got to test play one of those, and I was blown away by how it felt. A pro, one of the most amazing valves I've ever played, for sure. Um, so I'd like to jump right into this. Um, you have found very great success at a young age as a trombonist, and it's not because of luck, I think. So I thought it would be really uh, cool for you to talk a little bit about what your life was like when you were younger and you were practicing with, uh, with focus and determination Talk maybe a little bit, give us, uh, give us some highlights and windows into what your life was like from maybe end of middle school all the way through winning that job in the Met. I think you were, what, 26, 27 at the time? Yes, I was 26, and I won my yeah. job at the Fort Worth Symphony at 24. Yeah, nothing to sneeze at. So go ahead, I'll give, I'll give the floor to you here. So I feel like I actually have to start in sixth grade, really, um, and there is a little bit of luck involved. Um, for example, uh, in sixth grade, uh, my band director got fired because a student threw a euphonium down on the ground and that band director locked him in a tuba closet, but forgot to take him out for the entire day. So he oh got fired, understandably. <laughs> um, and then a new teacher came in, uh, Stephen Moss, who gave me free lessons. And I wouldn't have had lessons. For, he was a trombone player. You know, I wouldn't have gotten those if that had not happened. So, um, you know, I, I obviously it's not all luck, but I do like to point out where there definitely is just random chance involved. Um, and, you know, in those lessons um, from sixth grade to eighth grade, um, I, I remember one of the first things he did was he just plopped Bluebells of Scotland in front of me and said, hey, here's a, a high C, see if you can hit it. And then he taught me double tonguing and triple tonguing and showed me, you know, like um, recordings of the New York Phil and things like that. And just kind of that was my intro to just like, what can the trombone actually do, like at its extremes? And I, prior to that, I had no idea. And that really excited me. Like I would skip lunch to practice just to learn how to triple tongue, you know, multiphonics, um, circular breathing, all that stuff. Um, so that was just a really, really uh, amazing like start that I feel like I had that, um, that I know a lot of people do not, especially in middle school. Um, but uh, starting in seventh grade, I started competing in the high school, um, all region uh, tryouts. I, I remember my, I made seventh chair my first year trying that. Um, and then by the time I got to my senior year, I finally made all state. Um, but up to that in high school, I was about one or two chairs away every time from qualifying. Um, and, uh, you know, that really was my primary motivation was just competitions. Um, a couple other kind of highlights in high school were um, I got uh, the year before I got outstanding solo and on, uh, outstanding performer in solo and ensemble contests. Um, I played for the first time at the state level and I got so nervous that I blacked out. Um, so wow. that was, uh, that was a really defining moment, you know, because like that was as bad as it could get, like my knees were shaking and I, and regardless, because it's a memorized uh, competition at the state level, I still played through it like kind of on autopilot. And so that really let me know, Oh, I don't actually have to worry about nerves because like my muscle memory will at least get me through the piece, you know, not that yeah. I didn't get nervous ever again. Of course I did. But like, I think that was a really um, good thing for me to go through. Um, and then um, the next year I got outstanding solo, uh, outstanding performer. And I think that's when I um, actually decided to be a music major, which was about a week before the deadline to actually apply uh, <laughs> to be a music major. And um, then I, I had no idea what an excerpt was. I had no idea what the standards were. So I just recorded, I think my high school etudes and the solo I had played. And um, 
turns out that it never made it to the right people. So then my freshman year was spent, the first week of uh, school was spent scrambling, trying to become a music major and taking auditions at the last minute and just in general, having no idea what was going on. Um, so that's kind of another bit of luck because it's very possible that the people I was talking to would not have wanted to help me, you know? Right. Um, so uh, after that, um, you know, I started, I realized that, um, you know, freshman year that I actually had to practice like a full three, four hours a day and develop a schedule and a calendar and practice plans and things like that. Um, but uh, I was really bad at all that. So instead, what I did was I just overbooked myself with auditions and competitions so that I never had to worry about having a, a goal to work on. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I essentially just, you know, um, I think I did about maybe seven or eight solo competitions um, and won about five or six of them um, in my undergrad. Um, and uh, then I think I took about 15 professional auditions starting from my sophomore year, starting with the Cincinnati Orchestra. Um, and wow. uh, that was, uh, I did not get past the first round. Um, I didn't even make it through the first round, um, just FYI. But, uh, you know, that, I think, um, I think that about covers kind of the majority of it. Um, I guess actually my grad school um, experience was one of massive burnout. Like the Shepherd School is a great place. And thankfully it was much, much, much more relaxed of an environment than Baylor. So I had time to kind of live out my burnout and um, I didn't have to play in seven ensembles uh, in a day. And, uh, you know, and I think that actually helped. I kind of got to recover my physical chops from um, not, you know, like the physical wear and tear but also like mentally I was able to recover and kind of refine why I actually like music. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of, it obviously sounds like it all just, it's like this perfect storm of events because it worked out in the end. Um, but uh, you know, at the time I was just kind of, you know, trying to stay busy, trying to find reasons to keep practicing, you know? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's easy to burn out when you're that busy for sure. Uh, yeah. But you, I mean, you were also in a, in a very inspiring place at Rice. Uh, you had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you had some, some pretty inspiring roommates as well. You were in a situation where the trombone level was super high, just all around you all the time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Paul Radke, my roommate uh, from Rice, uh, is now second trombone in the LA uh, Philharmonic. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, I guess, I guess that's, um, that, that's something that a lot of people can relate to being in a situation where, you know, you're, you're not really sure how to prioritize your time as an undergraduate and you know that you need to be um, constantly working and striving to achieve uh, goals in terms of, you know, furthering your, your trombone playing life, but you also have all these personal goals in your practice. And uh, I know that we've talked before about the idea of, um, you know, if you have this technical hurdle that you're trying to overcome, maybe you want to learn to triple tongue really fast. You know, one option is to approach repertoire that, that will force you to bring that level uh, up and, you know, learn to, to really be motivated externally like that. So I think that's really interesting, too, that you went through all these competitions. Not everybody has the competition experience background, but it, it certainly worked really well for you as a motivator. Yeah, for sure. I, I just was, frankly, I was just not motivated by practicing excerpts. Um, and playing in orchestra, while I thought that was fun, I just never really had, if I had a choice between auditioning for a festival or a solo competition, I remember thinking kind of naively, well, I'm going to go for the one that gives me a prize if I win, you know? Right. So, um, I don't know. I've always liked, I, I wanted to be a soloist um, until I realized that I didn't actually want the lifestyle of a soloist. Um, and not that, uh, like I said, or orchestra playing is super fun and I love playing in, you know, in the pit with operas. Um, but yeah, I think uh, part of those goals definitely included um, finding ways to make my competition experience um, useful when I decided to kind of pivot to orchestral playing. Yeah, and I know that you were also, a, you know, you were a, a participant in the uh, Tchaikovsky competition last year. Um, you know, those, those videos are archived as well. You can all see John play. It's absolutely wonderful video footage and you'll learn a lot from watching that as well. As I'm sure you learned a lot from competing, that was probably quite a life-changing experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, First thing I learned is that I'm not at all over my nerves and also that uh, if I'm going to do a, another solo competition, I need to um, get back into solo playing more so because I was kind of cold after like two years of the Forest Symphony, not giving any recitals or anything like that. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty nerve wracking and um, just to kind of jump back into it in such a high pressure televised experience. Um, and I definitely made some mistakes that I wish I hadn't because of that specific reason. But I mean, ultimately, I think I did pretty well considering the circumstances where like, 
you know, I kind of found out I made it a month before the competition and I had, I was playing the ring cycle at the time and, you know, like managing chops during that whole thing was just- I can't even imagine having to practice while doing the ring cycle multiple, I mean, you must be what, five, six shows a, a week at least? Yeah, especially towards the end of that, my first season. Um, I remember um, Barbara Curry uh, constantly asking me, wait, is this your first year? Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I would hate to start this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my goodness. That's that's really something. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I think that you can all definitely relate to that and probably glean a lot of information, but I'll move on um, to another question. Um, and this is a question that uh, I know makes uh, trombonists sometimes feel vulnerable uh, to answer, but I also think that there's so much value for listeners to be able to really understand that uh, no player, even at the very top echelons of what we do, is impervious to struggle. So, John, if you don't mind talking a little bit about it, I'd love to ask you about um, a skill that, uh, that was maybe difficult for you and something that uh, maybe pushed you to your limit. Uh, you know, you maybe considered, uh, this is really hard, maybe this isn't for me. And what kept you in the game and kind of allowed you to, to persevere through that difficulty in your playing? Yeah, um, that's a hard question for me. Um, I think in terms of like, in terms of skills that have been consistently difficult for me, um, and, you know, that to, to, you know, the point where it was like detrimental to my ability to actually just get through something. Um, <laughs> this might sound silly, but like my middle F partial has always been the worst partial on my horn. And just getting a, cl a clear uh, immediate response when I'm articulating has always been like one of the most difficult things for me to do. Um, and, and most excerpts are in that range. So like, you know, um, especially like something like, um, William Tell or not William Tell, um, uh, Legaza Ladra, you know, it's nothing but mid range articulation. And, and, and if I go, ta, 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 you know, I'm out of the audition. Um, and I say it's a difficult question because frankly, um, most problems on the horn I've found fairly, easy to work on and fix if not you know like obviously it's you know not that it's easy initial but um <clears throat> and that this one the mid-range stuff it's been i mean i still kind of have to think about it um it's just one of those weak areas of my playing that no matter what i no matter what i throw at the wall in terms of practicing uh it doesn't ever stick like i would come up with three different ways of solving the issue one day and i would sometimes think eureka that's it i figured it out and then the next day it would be right back to scratch, you know? So mm -hmm. that's always been super frustrating. Um, I wouldn't say I ever considered quitting because of it, um, but um, maybe kind of related to something I already said with the burnout stuff, like that was probably the scariest moment for my career um, before Rice, like that last year before I was graduating, like I knew I was not going to pursue a doctorate. And then I knew that after, you know, um, after I graduated, I would have to start paying back my student loans I would have to work full time. And um, my best options were teaching, um, which, you know, like, not that I dislike teaching, but teaching 80 students for half hour lessons for a 40 hour work week was just uh, uh, um, perhaps not appealing for you. Yeah, it was it was just gonna, it, at the very least, it was going to be draining, you know, and sure. leave me time to actually practice to try to get a job. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can know. I can certainly relate to that. That is a that's a struggle in my playing as well, um, as we've talked about before. And uh, yeah, it's 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 very interesting when uh, when trombonists find a solution that works one day, and the next day it doesn't, and it doesn't even not work. It's completely a different a different animal to have to deal with. You know, this is a uh, this is a this is a side effect to why we practice. We're building a, a trajectory of being able to solve problems, not knowing the solution to one problem. And it's really that flexibility uh, that seems to make the difference long term with being able to put the work in. You know, you said a few minutes ago that um, you've never run into a problem that wasn't easy to fix if you worked on it. And you know, that mentality of just being able to, to troubleshoot as you go day by day and reassess where you are each day and then putting the time in seems to be a pretty good system. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I think a lot of people can get in their own way by um, uh, just perhaps at some point deciding on some level, maybe subconscious, that uh, the problem they're facing is simply insurmountable for them. And um, maybe it's just my optimism um, in general about the world, but also myself that I don't think there is such a thing. I think it's even no matter how difficult, you know, it may take a thousand hours to fix it, but there is a solution out there for every problem. Yeah. 
you just have to simply be willing to put the thousand hours in, which, uh, you know, you had the right motivations and that there, there's a, there's a lesson there for all of us for sure. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. Uh, I would love to talk about um, practicing at different age levels. And this is, this is a question that quite frankly, a lot of my uh, subscribers have written in and asked about. And uh, I guess we can do this as just, you know, individual flags on the field. If you could just talk a little bit about uh, something that sticks out to you that maybe middle school level players should really focus in on to grow, something that high school level players should really focus in on to grow, and then undergraduate uh, players that are majoring in trombone should really be focused on. These are like maybe a skill that you, as, as, a, as a flag bearer for the trombone community, would notice and say, this is something that really will set you apart. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, I'll do my best to answer that question. Um, I think in middle school, um, one of the best things that you can do um, that would set you apart is, I mean, putting in the practice hours sounds like a, a trite question, but I mean, it's a lot of people just don't, you know, like um, I remember when I was in middle school, you know, most of my colleagues might have practiced 30 minutes or an hour a day and I did two that made a big difference, you know, so if you can, if you really want to get better and you're motivated, then, you know, like try to make a habit of practicing, but more so than that, like you have to have a reason for practicing. And I think especially in the beginning stages of playing trombone, you can be playing such basic stuff that you kind of like, why am I doing this? Right. So don't be afraid to kind of go outside of your band system and seek out either lessons or seek out music that you actually enjoy playing. You know, I had a student who, um, is, I'm teaching some middle school students now and she asked me, or I asked her rather, um, hey, what, what song would you like to play eventually? What would you like to be able to do? And she immediately, without hesitation, said, Star Wars Imperial theme. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm like, okay. So I typed it out and, um, and now we're working on that and she can play through it. And I can tell that she actually is practicing more because she has something she actually wants to play. So, I mean, don't be afraid to go beyond hot cross buns to go play a pop song or something if that's what gets you to practice the horn. For high school, um, you know, I mean, some similar things, but I think in high school, especially, you want to start thinking about developing your extended technique. So grab an Arpin's book, learn double tonguing, tonguing, triple tonguing, range. Um, if you want to eventually become a professional or um, just get better at the horn, you definitely should have a lesson teacher if you at all can afford it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Maybe the, the biggest thing that I had to learn the hard way was that patience in your practice is absolutely the number one way to improve fast. It's kind of counterintuitive, but um, I remember in high school just wanting to just play the etudes over and over again until it got better. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to focus on one measure. I didn't want to fix one problem. I wanted to fix all of it. And that's just not how practicing works, you know? Um, and when I realized that if I actually like sit down and focus on this one thing that I keep missing, you know, keep cracking the high B flat and I actually fix that, then, hey, it's fixed for all my other sessions and all my other B flats instead of, you know, just kind of going through the motions. For college, um, I would say this is when you really want to um, start focusing on, uh, you know, I mean, God, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to just say like one thing. Oh, no, I, I totally agree. I know it's a yeah. tough question. Um, I mean, recording yourself this is when i started doing it maybe i mean you probably should record yourself throughout all this in general but i think this is when you like get the most benefit from listening to lots and lots of different recordings you know learning your theory about how music works like if you haven't already become the world's greatest musical interpreter this is when you should do it because you'll obviously if you're in a music major you'll be taking lessons you'll be getting better at your technique learning repertoire all that stuff right um but no one can really teach you your own musical preferences and so like that's something you have to discover on your own um through listening to recordings and saying i like this why do i like this like what is this person doing differently than this person who i hate this recording what are they doing that is so atrocious compared to this you know my right. my favorite example is um christian Lindbergh um on the grand doll recording to me it's just like one of the most vibrant exciting recordings out there um, versus others who, while they may sound good, they may be technically perfect. You know, it's that musicality, that's that extra something. And, um, and it takes work. It takes, um, you know, skill. I, I remember um, thinking to myself in college, like, I need to become the kind of interpreter 
that could stand next to Michelangelo carving out David and say, yeah, I could do something like that, you know, if I were a sculptor, you know what I mean? Not yeah. that, like, you have to be the, you have to, like, that was also, like, a creation of art, but, like, you know, could you, could you craft out David? Could you see it in your mind's eye, you know, musically speaking, right? Um, that's a skill, and it has to be worked on. Yeah, wow. That's so one thing that really sticks out uh, for your playing in my eye is your sound concept, John, and I really want to talk a little bit about it. Um, I don't know that there are a lot of trombone players out there that have as large a sound as you have with the finesse that you play with. Um, it's really inspiring to me, and I'm sure anybody else that has heard you uh, is also inspired by it. And I thought you might talk a little bit about how your sound, sound concept is built in your head and then how you practice your sound concept. Sure. sure. Um, so to be perfectly honest, it's not really something I've thought super deeply about. Um, you know, I think just from early on, I kind of had you know, the sound of Joe Alessi in my head is kind of the ideal. Um, and I always liked, I was able to grasp pretty early on kind of why he sounded so impressive. It's, it's kind of like he said, it's this huge sound. Um, but it's, just, I don't know, there's actually, I don't have the words for it, but I know it in my head. <laughs> um, but basically, like, um, apart from a few basic instructions that I got, like, you know, open up your mouth and, you know, adjust your air to buzz ratio and all that stuff, like, I really didn't practice sound as like a dedicated concept for a long time until maybe like junior, senior year in college. And, um, and maybe the only thing I got also an in instruction was, oh, you sound too, too uh, laser beamish. So, you know, back that off. Um, so I guess what really kind of, the few things that I kind of thought of that I think really actually had an effect um, were one, I remember this one experience where, uh, Carl Lenthe came in uh, for Masterclass at Rice, and he had been playing bass trumpet with the Houston uh, Grand Opera for the ring, ring Cycle, right? And he had to borrow our trombones, and he played on, like, My Shires and Edwards, something else, and he sounded exactly like a bass trumpet on all of them, which I thought was crazy, because I was playing an even heavier, like, red brassy build at the time. Wow. And, like, and so, like, to sound like a bass trumpet, I'm like, okay, so clearly, it's all here. Like, your entire sound right. is basically all here, and so, like, whatever's in your head is is going to be what comes out i think eventually and so just to be able to clearly to be able to understand a sound not just like say listen to joe alessi oh that sounds great to be able to be like he has this quality uh whatever that is on this note um you know how can i achieve that i think most of that work happens kind of subconsciously your brain adjusts all the little micro muscles and the way you blow and um apart from the like i said the generic things like oh, I'm tensing up my air. Don't do that, you know. The, the actual sound I think you get is maybe half just your physical features of, of your face and your dental structure and half what you kind of, you know, what you've been thinking of when you play and, and subtly shaping your sound towards. Yeah. And so if that's, if that's a really organic uh, sound concept for you, I would imagine that it was influenced a lot by the music that you listened to and the amount of listening that you did all through those years as well yeah. i can actually go uh i mean yeah that's that's definitely the case um it's definitely an amalgamation of all the things that i've liked in other people's playing up to now and it's not literally just tone it's kind of like how do i think about this how do i think about the effect of what effect an accent has or what do, what is the purpose of a crescendo those are all kind of part of my sound concepts and i got a lot of that stuff from christian Lindbergh. um and just on a practical level talking about the practice aspect being able to control your tone or your sound uh, let's say just on one variable, your, your uh, volume, being able to accurately come in and say mezzo piano 0.2 and then crescendo to mezzo piano 0.8, you know, and then back down or something like being able to do those very subtle hairpins and be consistent at it. That's like a large part of why I think um, younger players are not effective at phrasing is because they just cannot come in at the same uh, dynamic level every time and control it to a great degree. And so their phrases just come across as kind of cudgels, essentially, you know? I see. Um, maybe I could phrase that better, I don't know. <laughs> well, what, 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 how do you work on that when you're in the practice room and you're trying to define parameters for your control of dynamic and entrance points of dynamic? Do you have a specific exercise that you use? Do you have a way that you approach that in music uh, in the practice room at a practical level? Um, if I were working at it as like a fundamental kind of thing, um, it's mostly just hairpins, um, playing 
deliberately playing soft, doing slurs softly, you know, that's usually the most difficult uh, part of the control. Right? Sure. Um, working on my tapers. But in terms of like how I approach it when I'm actually working on a solo or something, it's a lot more organic. Um, I remember um, when I started kind of in college working on my musicality, um, that was a very, very, uh, what's the word? Exhaustive process. So like um, I knew kind of how I wanted a phrase to feel, but I didn't know quite how to achieve that. So what I would do is I would sing the phrase or even say two notes. Da, da, you know, in Love's Enchantment. Um, that's in like the second variation or something. Mm -hmm. Third, first variation. Um, anyway, it's uh, it's just that phrase, like trying to figure out exactly how much to crescendo, at what point to do the most crescendo, um, you know, uh, the starting dynamics, all that stuff, all that feel to get a certain like emotion in my head. Getting that just singing took a long time. Um, and I would literally just experiment like, okay, let's try doing 5% more this time and see how that feels, you know? And then once I had that down really, really well, I would then record myself and play it or sing it uh, while recording and play it back to back. And so I could kind of go, okay, that wasn't the exact same thing, you know? So that, that was like the, the meat and potatoes of it. And at this point, since I kind of have that skill already pretty well developed, I can just kind of look at a piece of music and just execute it more or less how I want it to go. Sure. Wow. That's really useful. Um, I'd like to give uh, a little bit of a, of a nod back to a, a different area of your career that maybe isn't always talked as, about as much, and that's, well, quite frankly, because you're the principal trombone in the Met, um, and that is your teaching. So for those of you that don't know, uh, John is actually the, the teacher at, um, one of the teachers that you may study with at Bard and Rutgers and the Manus School. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about your teaching and highlight it because I think that your uh, philosophy of education is, is a little bit different than a lot of the very high level trombone players out there. And I say that because, um, quite frankly, uh, I, I've played for you before. And uh, some of the things that you talked about in your teaching were really fascinating to me. And th this is something that I geek out on pretty heavily. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask you about the idea um, you, you once said to me that you really believe that every student uh, can, can be successful and that they're just at different points in their journey towards their goal and that your job is, as a pedagogue is to help walk them in the right direction regardless of where they're starting from. And I, I thought that was really profound because um, generally very high level players like yourself get very good students and your willingness to, to recognize that everybody is, is on a different point at, uh, in the path towards their goal was pretty spectacular to me. So I thought I'd ask you to talk a little bit about your uh, educational philosophy. Sure. sure. So let's say that I'm dead wrong on, on that, that some students just won't ever make it, you know, uh, or they can't, no matter how much work they put in. Let's say that's true, hypothetically. As a teacher, I still don't think that I should treat students that way. I shouldn't make that judgment call for them, you know, because I can't predict the future. And, um, and yeah, it could very well be that um, they're just simply a weaker student currently that's in one of my studios may very well, do, you know, have a light bulb moment is what I've heard it call, uh, called, where suddenly just everything you've been teaching them clicks and they're just start improving rapidly. And, you know, or maybe it's not something you taught them. Maybe they just like, you know, had other issues in their life or in their playing and it just, you know, something changes and it clicks. You just don't know that as a teacher, even if, you know, it's, it's, it, it's true that, uh, you know, some people just won't, can't make it, which I don't, I, again, I don't believe that, you know. Um, I do not either. <laughs> yeah. So um, in terms of like kind of how I like to set up my, my lessons and uh, my general pedagogy, uh, that's a tough one to summarize, I suppose. But um, generally speaking, I think my priority as a teacher is to help students learn how to listen to their own body and identify what variables are at play in a given problem um, so that they can learn to fix their problems on their own. Um, so like in lessons, I'll spend a lot of time workshopping one thing um, in order to like really tear it down and kind of figure out, okay, this is what you're doing at this part of your body. And um, that's why it's affecting your airflow. Do this experiment. You see how that affects your airflow or whatever, you know? And, um, and I think some of my students find that kind of annoying, frankly, that I like am so verbose about explaining why certain things happen. And they just kind of want to put the horn back up and do it and see if it's better. But I think in the long run, it's really important to actually know what you are changing and why it affects your playing and how it affects it, you know? Yeah. 
it's one it's almost one giant science experiment where you're you're a mad scientist collecting data because that data you can use later on to to make all of the adjustments yourself if you can really adjust to be able to teach yourself that's that's the goal right <laughs> yeah i'm trying to put myself out of business <laughs> yeah <laughs> of course um what's the star wars quote quote we are what they grow beyond yeah, uh, that's yeah. A good one. I think about that a lot. Um, all right, let's do some lightning round questions as we're running a little tight on time. Uh, John, what is your favorite movie? Uh, let's say the original Lion King. Oh, great movie. Classic. Um, do you have a favorite trombone solo that you've either played or that you just love listening to? Yeah, um, that's a tie between the Grand Doll Concerto and Eras of Time. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, I, will, I will jump in and say that my favorite trombone solo ever is pretty much uh, one of the more difficult pieces to hear recorded, except you can hear it on John's YouTube channel, and that is the Defumere Cello Concerto, which is uh, yeah. absolutely <laughs> awesome, and you should all check it out. Uh, John, I would like to ask you about the most terrifying moment you've had performing in your life. Um, that is a tie between the Tchaikovsky competition and the first time I played solo and ensemble where I blacked out, as previously mentioned. <laughs> Those are good answers. <laughs> Those are fair times to be afraid, I think. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite book? Uh, yeah, um, probably, it may, be, may not be the best book I've ever read, but my favorite read I've ever had is the Aragon series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, and then finally, is there an aspect of your trombone playing right now that you're looking to change that you've been working on that you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, um, I would like to have, uh, I would like to have a more Joe Alessi-esque high F. I know that's the most mundane thing, to, <laughs> but you know, being able to ring out a super F or F sharp above, say, like a 40 piece brass ensemble, like uh, that project that I took part of a while back. That would be a oh really my cool goodness. skill to have. <laughs> that F and his E too. Those are scary. Oh my yeah. goodness. If you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about the Game of Thrones recording, Reigns of Casimir, which you should absolutely listen to. It is terrifying. John, are you, are you telling me that he's the only person playing that F in that recording? Yeah. That's even worse. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, I go down what? the list. I see all my friends in that recording. And I think, wow, they all have great high Fs. And then I hear that and you're telling me that it's one person. Yes, I was on the uh, first part. So yeah, we, we think high C was the max. Um, wow. Well, uh, at the end of all of these uh, interviews, I always like to give my guests an opportunity to talk for a couple minutes about uh, something that they're working on, uh, projects that they have upcoming. So I know that we're all in a really strange time with the pandemic, fun, but I'd love to hear what you're working on right now. and you know, Maybe share with us some of your, some of your current projects. Sure, um, I've got a lot on my plate. Um, which is a great problem to have, especially during this pandemic. Um, yeah. I'm working on a, a jazz uh, quintet arrangement of um, The Girl from Ipanema. Um, we got to have it sung in Portuguese, and um, that's taking a lot of my time. Um, it's got a rhythm section and everything. Um, but I'm also, um, I started my Patreon, and I'm trying to figure out um, maybe like a streaming schedule where I could do a mixture of music-related things um and also maybe gaming stuff um in case people are interested in that you know but uh yes yeah definitely um got a lot of things in the works so that's great that. yeah you guys should all check out john's patreon uh if you've seen any of his uh arrangements of the uh the piano uh works that uh, and the string quartets that he's been working on and um pulling into uh, trombone quartet arrangements. They're absolutely uh, stupendous. He did a Barber Adagio for strings that is absolutely wonderful. And all those projects are things that John can work on, uh, provided that we are members of Patreon. So you should absolutely check that out if you have the ability to. Supporting the community, uh, both financially and with your time is just so important during times like this for all of us. Um, John, thank you so much for giving me some of your time and sharing uh, some of your wisdom and your experience with the rest of us. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Uh, happy practicing, everybody, and I'll see you next week.